Now, you're a clinically trained or, or traditionally trained psychiatrist who has had kind of a turnaround where now you don't prescribe, you went from prescribing pharmaceuticals to not believing in them at all. Yeah. And if I remember right, or if I understand right, you've also gone from believing, say, in DSM diagnoses to not really even believing in mental illness per se. Yeah. Is that is that right? Yes. Yeah. So would you, yes. <laughs> would you would you say that um, something like narcissism? Would you say that exists? And, and if not, what or, or, or other so-called mental illnesses? How would you redefine them and re? What's the new way of thinking about these kind of behaviors, if not as a mental illness? Mm. So yeah, psychiatrists are basically trained, which is useful in like pattern recognition, right? Because pattern recognition is like a very powerful way to navigate reality, and it it is demonstrable, and you know you can you can track the phenomena, and so a lot of what we have codified as pathologies are just patterns of human behavior and nothing in allopathic medicine like attempts to address the why right so it's just not even a relevant question because there's sort of some hand waving about genes and i don't know maybe it's just sort of like bad luck you know the breaks or whatever and of course it contributes to that underlying and like frequently reified like victim story right like poor me you know i'm just broken i'm just damaged this is just sort of how it is i'm powerless helpless dependent on this system that's like going to come rescue me and so you know if we're not asking why then we're just observing the what like observing the pattern so you have a picture of like mania and it tends to look like this so i'm certainly not it would be silly to suggest that that does not occur i've seen it <laughs> with my own eyes occur and the same goes with the question of, you know, so-called personality disorders, like in, because they're organized, right? Um, in this big dictionary, you reference the DSM, which is like ever expanding and embarrassingly modified once in a while, like, you know, to take like homosexuality out of the book or whatever. And, um, and in the cluster B personality disorders, they're called, there's, you know, like borderline personality disorder, which hasn't gotten as much you know, um, mainstream notoriety. And then there's the narcissistic category. And that is like, if you scroll social media anywhere, or maybe it's just like my AI, <laughs> you know, tracked field, I don't know, but it's, there's so much, um, I don't know if you, if you use the term like loose ritual, I don't think I've heard you use it, but maybe you do, you get the concept, right? Obviously there's yeah. so much of that, like fomenting the pain body. I think it's particularly of women, in dynamic with so-called narcissists and like would i suggest that that pattern doesn't exist of personality traits um where there is like a utilitarian interpersonal um you know relationship dynamic where you know there's certain um kinds of behaviors like whether it's ghosting or gaslighting and all these like trendy terms no i'm not suggesting it doesn't exist it's just the question of why is not addressed right so mm. and there's also like the finger pointing, blaming, like villain game, right? So, you know, the Cartman triangle, there's like the victim. So this is the poor empath, right? And then you have the the bad guy, narcissist. And then there's like whomever is the self-help coach, right? Who's there to save you, right? Is the rescuer or sometimes the system, obviously. And the, the idea that the narcissist is like a bad person, right? Or that they're actually like, is such a thing as a bad person? person is like an existential question, right? And if you just see that pattern of behavior as stemming from an adaptation to trauma, you know, trauma that we all have experienced in various ways because we were raised, all of us in conditional environments where we <clears throat> were enculturated around, like these are good traits that you have, you know, when you're quiet and you're well behaved. Um, and these are you know, problematic traits that you have. And when you exhibit them, you're going to either like, I'm going to either ignore you or I'm going to punish you. Right. So it's like mm -hmm. on a spectrum of like consequences. Mm -hmm. um, we adapt. Right. So you either adapt to, you know, sort of like, like, let's say 
I can't remember who used this analogy, but I like it. Um, let's say you have like little crumbs on the table and a bunch of starving kids, right? And there's going to be the kind of kid who's like, fuck it, I'm going to take mine, right? Like, let me get my crumbs, right? That's the narcissistic coping method. And then you're going to have the kid that's like, oh, um, well, it, here, you can have this one. And if I give you this one, will, will you, can I have one and then, you know, and that's the codependent. And it's just two sides of the same coin. So this framing of like the empath or the codependent as like the good guy, right? And the narcissist as the bad guy is just another version of this victim expression, that ultimately disempowers those who are attempting to, you know, um, heal themselves and integrate from their co-created re-encounter with the same dynamic of um, the selfish parent, right? Like, but I'm, I'm sure, you, you know, you probably, I don't know, I've come to similar conclusions that the the, the concept of selfishness, um, it's, it's leveraged, right? Because of the way that virtue signaling is a very important part of any psyop. It's a very important part of any agenda to then do the good guy, bad guy thing, right? And so like, you know, you, you, you wear the mask, you get the medical intervention, you participate in this way, you comply, you're obedient. That means you're, you're the good guy, right? And you're serving, you know, you're taking care of grandma or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's really like embedded as like the better version of the adaptation to trauma. But I'm not sure that assigning um, moralistic like values to these adaptations um, serves us, mm -hmm. you know, or it serves any of us. And I think it's it ends up being like part of um, a lot of what allopathy is here for, which is to, you know, um, render pathological what what is ultimately a normative response. You know, like if you've heard that Krishnamurti quote, like it's no sign of health to be well adapted to a profoundly sick society, right? Well, we're mm -hmm. we're saying that the people who are, you know, um, struggling to adapt are sick or broken, mm -hmm. instead of having like you know demonstrating a wise response to what's very wrong, you know, with, with our lifestyles. And we're only like pathologizing one half of it by claiming the narcissist has the mental illness, whereas the empath is the hero and, you know, yeah. there's nothing wrong with them. But what it, what I'm hearing, correct me if I'm wrong, is that perhaps the better way would be some middle road because the narcissistic way is kind of a selfish, I'm going to get mine and make sure everything's okay for me, which is self-love which right. at some, in some way is healthy. You have to have some degree of that. Uh, and that's the, on the other side, the empathic version. If you just have so much empathy for everyone else and you don't have enough for yourself, you might end up giving, 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 and then having nothing left for yourself, reinforcing that victim narrative. Therefore, you've gone too far the other way. And I guess that is pathologized in words like codependent, like you used before. Um, but often <clears throat> it would be dichotomized with something like an empath, which is just as I would only hear as a positive thing, and exactly. narcissist, which always is a negative thing. Um, but if the actual best path would be the middle path, then really the narcissistic or completely empathic path wouldn't really be the way to go. You have to consider others and consider yourself and then do kind of a middle road thing that work, you know, what's best both for you and for the others, I guess. Um, and I also wanted to say, what what about, say, psychopathy? And at that end of the spectrum, uh, I've heard that they have like no empathy and no capacity for empathy. And it's to the point that you can do brain scans on a psychopath and see certain areas not firing that would relate to compassion and so it's like they have some kind of physical inability or spiritual inability to feel for other people that makes them inherently selfish and if that's the case um you know is that a pathology could that be labeled as a mental illness or is that also being looked at incorrectly and that is also on this sliding scale of um like we're talking about empath to balanced person to narcissist and then maybe psychopath is just really up there but still not a some classification that we need to put a box around them and they're they're this different thing from everyone else in humanity um 
they too are are maybe on this scale and can be reined in through certain techniques that haven't yet been devised because as I've heard so far there is no way to reform a psychopath. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I love this this question and I think a helpful frame, right, if we're looking at these different patterns um, of, of behavior and, you know, really personality, it, a helpful reframe is to recognize that we have needs, right? We have needs. You cannot unneed your needs. And so the self-relating, the, the relationship and the consciousness and awareness that we have to our own needs is really the only distinguishing factor in some ways between these different patterns, right? Because even the way that you're talking about like the codependent or the empath, it's like they're serving others, they're serving others, they're outwardly focused, right? But the truth is, according to to me and others, mm -hmm. is that they're serving themselves. They are meeting their own needs. And I'm sure this is also, you know, um, apparent to you. They're meeting their own needs in the meeting of another's needs. That's actually how they secure safety, right? So it's it's not an altruistic, you know, offering. It's actually how they meet their needs. It's how they feel safe. And there is like a covert, unspoken exchange, right? You appreciate me. I secure, you know, some sort of um, attachment to you. I feel like a good person. That makes me feel safe. This is how I am meeting my needs. And, you know, in this sort of like more direct taking of needs without, you know, so you could say an intrinsic focus without um, balancing a consideration for how it's going to feel for somebody else. It's just another way of meeting needs that feels safer. And so what happens when somebody is so fundamentally disconnected from the fabric of the human experience that the way that they meet their needs is to use people in a utilitarian, hyper utilitarian fashion for their own um, stimulus, really, like internal activation, maybe relief from the numbness, you know, that has overtaken their system. I think it's it's just another pattern. And, you know, in the past couple of years, many of us have felt invited to explore this question of, is there evil, right? Is there such a thing? Um, who Who is pulling the strings behind, you know, the agenda? Is it, you know, like some, you know, reptile race somewhere? Or is it, you know, um, just some real bad people, right? Some bad characters who need to go to jail, you know, like what is, um, what is driving the suffering and struggle, the deception? What is behind it? And I'm the one inquiring, so I must be on the side of of good and right. And I'm I'm just gazing into the abyss of, you know, this seemingly endless potential of badness. And I don't know. I, obviously, there are a lot of um, potential consequences to moral relativism. But I've come to the conclusion that, in review of my own, you know, life journey, there are many, many bad things that I have done, right, and would do, in 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 a certain context with a certain um, paradigm that I opted into, with a certain worldview, I am capable of infinite badness. And um, it would be because it, I would engage that because it would make sense to me at the time. And it would be the right way, seemingly, to meet my needs or the most accessible way, right? And and the only, only path out of those potentialities is my connection to God. Right. And that disconnection drives all sorts of adaptive behaviors that we could call bad and evil. As you reconnect, you you gain a sense of um, your place, right? Your place in, in the mosaic, uh, in the mandala of it all. And you from from that vantage point understand that the acknowledgement of your own needs and the intentional um, curation of conditions meant to, you know, meet, designed to meet those needs is actually in service to everyone, right? So what's best, you know, if I choose from like deep exploration to, to leave my partner, it's 
most likely going to be the case that it's actually best for him too, even if it seems like, you know, I'm doing the insensitive thing or whatever, mm -hmm. that there's a, a harmony and um, a balancing of all of these acts. And that's probably also true on the other end of the spectrum, right? And of course, you know, we could get into like whether we choose intra life or something, you know, to engage these particularly heinous roles. Um, and exchange places or whatever over time. I don't, I obviously have no idea, but I, I like that consideration because I'm a big believer in radical responsibility and, uh, and, and choice and the power of choice that we retain through our entire incarnation. Yeah. Mm. So then would you then, what I'm hearing is that you would say that psychopathy is not a thing and it's just a response to uh, someone getting uh, their needs met uh, in a very unempathic way uh, for, for life, I guess, and they haven't found another better way to do it in their eyes. This works. It's been working my whole life. Uh, you know, so it's just a response. You don't think that there is a nature aspect to some of these things? Would you say it's all nurture? Hmm. Um, I believe in the potential for transformation, right? And the potential for um, the engagement of choice at any point, right? At any moment um, that that we can bring awareness to these patterns and just insert a little bit of space between the stimulus and the response, right? And in that little bit of space, we can, you know, choose different behaviors. And i I do, I must believe that that's available to all of us without exception. Um, how we come in, whether, you know, we're carrying burdens and um, experiences that inform us, you know, not only like from the moment of conception, but in utero and once we're born, you know, we've already potentially accumulated like quite a load <laughs> of, of patterns. Um, and then of course there's the whole birth experience and the medicalization of birth and the trauma they're in. And then, you know, there's obviously infancy and childhood and all the rest. Like there is so much material in our actual incarnation, let alone if you believe in, um, you know, past lives and, you know, ancestral, even ancestral uh, burdens. Um, one of my favorite books is uh, It Didn't Start With You and basically about, you know, how in our family lines we can, um, bring forward these conflicts that were that are almost like wanting completion right these these patterns of fear and pain and shame and grief and each successive generation is given the opportunity to respond differently and i'm a huge believer in that because i've seen family constellation which if people don't know is just a therapeutic modality it's not particularly a, a spiritual thing um and it's it's changed my life and I've watched it change so many people's lives and you can't explain how that could possibly be the case unless there are um, these meta phenomena in family lines that influence behavior, right? Like if you've ever, I don't know, if you if you see a pattern in your life, whether it's with addiction or finances or or romance and relationships, and, and you've just tried to bring so much self-help to it and it's <laughs> not budged, right? that's that's a place to look. It's like, am I carrying something that isn't mine, like from my family line? Is there something here? So when you look at all of these different sources of influence, it becomes sort of a very blurred, right? Like a false dichotomy, right? The nature nurture thing, um, because it's like all contextual experience. And, and there, I think the bigger question is like, how much of it do we choose versus how much is free will? Um, who knows? Because I know that in the personal work that I've done over the years, I still have the same shit. Like I still respond in the same reflexive way when I feel um, particularly like somebody is experiencing me as bad and wrong. And the only difference after all these years of work is that this is few moments, right? And and sometimes, you know, it's, it's like a minutes later, like for example, um, <laughs> I was texting with my my dad, right? And he texted me something I didn't like about somebody else. And we have a long le legacy in my family line of like 
I call it commiseration connection, right? So it's obviously what people do. It's you complain about, you triangulate against another person and you complain about them and then you feel connected or whatever. Um, and I just, at this point, I was like, I just, I don't, enough. Like, I don't want to participate in this. And I also know it's not personal. Like, he's not trying to annoy me or offend me or whatever. So my first response, immediate response was, so I'm aware, I don't like this, right? So I have a sensation in my body that is uncomfortable. And I have a choice there. One choice would have been to like, just sit with the sensation, like literally just for 30 seconds, 90 seconds, just sit with it. Okay. I know I have that choice at this point. Didn't choose that. <laughs> Instead, I text him back and I'm like, well, you know, that was not nice. And, you know, I, I try to me, Kelly, like I try to only say things about people that I would say to their face. Maybe you should consider that blah, 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 whatever. So I am like attempting to reorganize his behavior mm -hmm. from a place of superiority. Mm -hmm. And I have taken a very deep dive into man, woman relating. And I actually have strong beliefs that one of the greatest psyops is the disruption of the dynamic that exists between all men and all women. Um, but specifically, obviously in, you know, these family dynamics and then specifically in romantic dynamics. So I've been studying this. Okay. So I know better. If anybody knows better, it's me. <laughs> so I, here I am like telling not only a man, but the, the man, my dad, right. Telling him how to be a man, right. It's like the cardinal sin <laughs> of like man, woman relating is for a woman to imagine she knows better than a man, how he should man. Okay. So I did that, but it only took like maybe 90 more seconds for me to see that. And then I texted him back and I said, I'm not, you know, trying to tell you how to behave. What I really want to say is that it doesn't feel good for me, you know, when you do this. The end. Right? And so like that was, I, it took me all those it, iterations to, to get to the place where I recognize my feelings matter. Okay. Um, I have the opportunity to share that and I can let him know what I need and I'm not, you know, that's the end, right? I'm not here to make sure he follows through on it to, you know, resent him if he doesn't. And that's how I am a sovereign adult, right? So it's like, you know, the only difference after all this work is that just a little bit of awareness and enough space so that it's not like months and years before I recognize like, wow, I had, I had some choices there and I was acting from a place of my own discomfort and I could do it differently. <laughs> mm, right. And now, if we're, say we're dealing with a narcissist, uh, narciss sorry, narcissism yeah, doesn't exactly. exist. So in the, in the new paradigm where we're trying to work without labels and we see behaviors that would have previously been associated with these kind of things. And I heard you use a uh, I forgot what term you used, but I was thinking of the pop term, which was narcissistic supply, which is yeah. what they they seem to always want to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. You called it a yeah, louche yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. That that's like the soul trap version of the of the here and now uh, narcissist. What they're getting the, their narcissistic supply. I guess the the uh, beings of light in the after world get their louche <laughs> louche supply. Uh, it's parasitic, in in right? It's like a Russian dolls thing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Um, so they'll often say things like uh, no contact ever again, or that you need to set these super firm boundaries with people like this. Do you still in that in your model, say, would you still say that that um, behavior from the victim is still appropriate? Or is there something that the victim, the codependent, the you know the other polarity in these relationships could be or should be doing differently when you do interact that could potentially temper the narcissistic traits mm. and bring that person back towards being someone that you can actually relate to and have a relationship with because you do kind of set not the kind of boundaries that I'm hearing in most of these circles, which is no contact ever again or something really harsh like that. Um, though, I mean, in some cases, I, I tend to agree with that. Are there some cases where it, it, you could maybe turn the mirror on the, the victim and see things that the victim is doing that 
could be changed, you know, because we only have control over ourselves ultimately, which is why removing yourself from the situation is obviously one thing that we can control. But that's also seems somewhat like a cop out in some some scenarios that maybe the victim in the situation could um, be less victim like. In other words, stand mm -hmm. up for themselves, uh, love themselves, uh, set necessary boundaries and give themselves the time and space that they need in these relationships to make it work in a way that is beneficial for both parties. Is that Am I making sense about that or? 100%. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yes. So in line with what I shared earlier, I believe that it is possible. Uh, I, I believe that when we take personal responsibility, when we are actually in full awareness of our needs and we can soberly assess the person in front of us, you know, without all of these parental projections onto them, um, then we can, the phrase I use is like, we can see if we're buying eggs from the hardware store, right? Like if we are trying to secure love from the actually impossible place, we can see that and make choices, right? We can assess whether we are compatible or incompatible. Often like another related frame is like the love, this is a Pia Melody, um, sort of rubric, the love addict and the love avoidant, right? They're often very attracted to each other because of this eroticized wounding and trauma bonding, like the recognition of patterns from our childhood of sourcing from the impossible place, the love, mm -hmm. right? And this mm -hmm. desire to somehow have the experience of like the conversion, right? Like yep. turning, mm -hmm. you know, the hardware store into the grocery store kind of a thing. And, um, so so you engage in specific, as you were alluding to, you engage in specific patterns that activate and trigger the other person. And, you know, again, in another framework, Imago framework, there is totally possible for you to um, explore another arena of behavioral choice for your partner to do that. And for that to be actually the ultimate healing for each of you is to meet the other's needs in a way that would not otherwise have happened if you didn't have somebody in front of you who was hurt by you simply being you, mm. right? So that's very possible. Um, and it's obviously, you know, it's it's rare um, that people can commit on that, that level. And so that's why I, uh, you know, as somebody who has been through um, divorce, not one, but two times, um, I uh, have become like a huge believer in the covenant of marriage and um, the sacred nature of that union. And so something I, and I'm not talking about legal marriage, um, commodified bonds of your romantic ties, <laughs> but I I didn't, I didn't have a, a way of understanding that necessarily. Um, and I don't think, at least in, you know, um, our generation, there's like a, I don't know, like a, like a like a perspective on marriage that could encompass what it is to commit to the service, like the devotional service of something between you that is bigger than either of you, right? So we're still in that transactional model of like, you know, am I getting mine? Are you, you know, the other person saying, am I getting mine? And, you know, you, you can graduate into this more like diplomatic, like, you know, well, I, I was very hurt when you did that you know, Johnny kind of a thing. Like, I really, I don't want you to do that again. But um, one of, you know, the the teachers I respect more than anyone in my lifescape is David Data. And he teaches about polarity and has for many, many decades. And, um, and he talks about this third stage, right, with this aspirational stage where you're actually in devotion, not to the other person necessarily. That's almost like a, a side benefit. Um, to God through this person, right? And I think it would require that kind of commitment to transform these dynamics because otherwise the person is just serving your personal growth, right? And they can do that even in, I mean, anyone who's recovered from one of these dynamics knows that, you know, the, the wake of the, the relationship still is a, is a service arena, right? Like these, these dynamics help us to grow into our personal responsibility, into our self-awareness and, I've come to appreciate like inner polarities, right? Like my inner masculine, my inner uh, feminine. And 
I do think there is a time for the no contact, the no fly zone, right? Mm. Uh, for most of us, because there isn't a sufficient masculine maturity. There isn't like the king isn't at the helm of the cat. The helm is the wrong word. Like at the the front of the castle, right? Like he's he's not there yet. So he's not able to like assess the terrain and see who's coming and who's not and to make wise decisions. Like no one's really home yet. It's just like a like a bratty prince, <laughs> like mm -hmm. stomping around, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and so as you activate that sense of safety, right? Because if the masculine's role inside and outside is to confer safety, how do I do that for myself so that I can um, really assess what's going on in front of me and so that I don't take the bait, right? Mm -hmm. Because even in the neurophysiology world and somatic um, experiencing world, they call, they refer to it as neuroception, right? So, so this, this capacity that I can reclaim to see like a pile of clothes on a chair as laundry instead of like a boogeyman about to like murder me, right? Or whatever in the shadowy, you know, lighting of my bedroom. You can see with accuracy and you can assess that there's not in fact a danger coming at you. This is just a person being a person. Like, who am I? What do I feel? Like, what do I need in this moment? How do I communicate it? How do I meet my own needs perhaps? Um, and so, you know, in that maturational process, yeah, a lot of times these hard line boundaries, and I've been through this with every arena with food, like super hard line boundaries, you know, with with all of my perspectives, like I'm, I'm like anything, literally like religion and marriage and health, you know, all of it. There, sometimes there's a phase where a hard line is essential, where where that confers that safety to your own system that otherwise isn't available. And then over time, you grow your spine, right? You grow this sense of like, I'm okay no matter what. Like I trust, I don't need to trust anybody else as I trust myself. I trust my discernment. I trust the sensations in my body to guide me. And I'm going to just make my choices, right? It, it's sort of like all the drama drains out. And that's when you can not have to block someone, <laughs> not have to, you know, totally excise them from your existence and you can interact with somebody again, maybe even somebody that you, you haven't spoken to in a decade or whatever, and it can feel not scary, right? It can feel mm -hmm. not dangerous, but that maturational process is really an internal one. It's like a self-relating, um, you know, journey, I guess mm -hmm. that not all of us are super interested, I guess, in going on. I don't know. Right. And when we label the other person in the situation, the narcissist say, then what we're one part of what we're seriously doing is projecting we're projecting okay. uh whatever we are not doing in this relationship or in this dynamic onto them and like you said earlier kind of like a good cop bad cop thing always putting ourselves in the good cop position and then labeling everyone else as you know variations of a bad cop exactly and i heard you mention david data which i've read his book called the way of the superior man yeah. and you also mentioned something about the dynamics between men and women and that's that seems to be his forte yeah. and the, the book um speaks of a lot of things that i think men in this current manosphere red pill community anti-feminist uh anti-woman um kind of milieu that's going on nowadays are doing the same thing I'm saying with the empath to the narcissist yes. and kind of like finger pointing everything that's wrong with the women rather than I think David Data in the way of the superior man is recognizing the same things that a lot of these guys in the red pill community uh, are recognizing about women and male female relationships. But instead of pathologizing and blaming the female half of it, yeah. He's tur he's turning the mirror on the men's half and seeing like like we're saying in this conversation, well what what do I actually control me right. and what can I do in this situation to um recover the dynamic. And so a lot of times I think women test men and it, you know, I call it shit testing or whatever you'd, yeah. you you want to call it. The idea is to see how manly you are or how you respond in certain situations and also to push you towards being, towards responding better, towards being more manly. 
and in that sense, and women are also kind of competitive in the sense of they're all looking for the, the best guy, the manliest man, the most successful man, um, all these measures um, of success or attractiveness in, women, in women's eyes are, you know, similar. And so in a way, the men are like the animals in the animal kingdom fighting each other um, to to get the the best women, the best women meeting with the best men intellectually, emotionally, physically, uh, and down the line. And if you look at it that way as just being, that's how it works rather than that's unfair, like a lot right. of <laughs> 2023 might look at it, um, then the whole male female dynamic is the women are pushing us to be better men mm. is, is what i'm getting at and rather than resent them for it for all their shit testing and the things they put us through we should be thanking them for it and recognizing that the highest value women are going to be the most difficult to to reach in that sense and the and you know, so you're going to get rejected way easier from them and they're going to give you way more shit tests and and it'll be easy to pathologize them and point fingers at, at that rich, you know, rich bitch or whatever, you know, the, or the, the 10 out of 10, you know, you can see that pampered butt syndrome, everything. But then, well, why are you going after her then if you have all these negative things that you think about her, yet you still want her, you know what I mean? Exactly. So I think there's a lot of um, not recognizing the male role uh, in this pathologizing of the female. And I, I'm looking at it from, as a male from this whole red pill community, but I think it goes the other way too. Totally. Uh, it, when women are in there, whatever they call their version of the community. It's called and feminism. That, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and then they look at men and our toxic masculinity and everything we do is wrong and pathologized to the point that just being a man and, you know, having manly decisions and opinions is is wrong and you can't live in society anymore is how it feels. And that's uh, this unbalance of the genders that I feel is taking place. Um, and... So with our discussion, I feel like it's the pathologizing that's the problem, which is what you found in your practice, the labeling, the idea of trying and that the DSM exactly. They started out with like six mental illnesses in the first manual, and now they're up to like 500 or something. Mm -hmm. So mental illnesses just keep popping up over the decades now. But obviously, that's not the case. It's just we keep labeling stuff as humans. And as time goes on, this habit of labeling things and putting it in a box and moving it to one side and then feeding them with pharmaceutical drugs or what have you um, is addictive. And we keep doing it. And so now we're addicted <laughs> to uh, to that behavior. So the next, the DSM-6 will probably have uh, psychiatry in it. <laughs> All <Yeah>. psychiatrists. <laughs> You know, have, have, you have an issue, you have an issue. Um, and the way, so the way to heal these issues is to stop labeling and pathologizing behaviors and just recognize, as you are saying, that these are all responses to people trying to get their needs met and previous traumas and perhaps um, getting their needs met in not the most beneficial ways, even when it comes to the male-female dynamic. So could you speak to that? And when you said how David Data was like your highest something or other, uh, w why and how is, is that the case? Um, uh, tell me more about your w work and how it relates to his work. Yeah. Oh, my God. I love this topic. It's like my favorite <laughs> topic. And um, I've recorded like many apparently controversial. I don't know. I just can't ever be not controversial. It's like my inner provocateur, but podcasts on this subject. And it, we're in a zeitgeist, right? So this topic is coming up for all of us and we have an opportunity to orient towards it that can determine like our worldview because it's that germane to our experience of being a human. Like how do you regard the other gender of the two, right? Like how do you regard? Um, and the, the recognition that that is actually how you are comporting yourselves, yourself toward your other half, right? So Jung called it like your anima, my animus, right? So the imprint of the, of man is in me. And I project that all over the world, not just on other men, but on institutions and concepts and, and the same, you know, in reverse is your experience. And how do we integrate that 
in service of our own wholeness, right? In service of our own experience of sacred union within, let alone interpersonally, let alone in the um, relooming of the fabric of the community and this, you know, tribe that has been so, um, you know, uh, frayed. So I think, you know, part of it is the self-betrayal at the root that's so enculturated at this point, at the root of these dynamics you're referring to, is the betrayal of one's own desire, right? So men, according to many who specialize in this area, who are men, um, apparently want the reflection of their own success from and through the body of a high value woman, right? And women, to generalize, obviously, uh, I don't often op offer those caveats because, you know, I'm speaking from my experience as a heterosexual woman, blah, blah, blah. Women want to be well handled by a powerful man. They want to submit and serve a man. Now, <laughs> when you, okay, so I was spoke at a Weston Price conference um, about like psychiatry stuff or whatever. There's like a couple thousand people in the audience. And somebody asked me about like the gender pronoun thing. And so I'm answering the question and I said, you know, I, d I personally don't know a woman who doesn't want to be well handled by a powerful man. And literally this, it was like a moan, like swept the room. Like literally it was like, like every woman in the audience is like, oh yes, finally. <laughs> <I forgot. laughs> like, it's been yeah. acknowledged. Yeah. <laughs> we, we are in a position where we have to pretend that we don't want and need what we want and need in order to feel social acceptance by virtue of these psyops, this multi-layered, I mean, you're talking about an even more fringe version, the red pill, but the new age, I actually think is, is more problematic, right? The, the, the dimensions of the new age, the, the psyop dimensions of the new age, as it's been run on men who are now encouraged, right, to engage egalitarian dynamics with women and to feel their feelings and, you know, to be courteous and respectful of women, all this stuff. I mean, yes, of course, like any good psyop, there are many grains of truth in there and, you know, valid uh, perspective. And then there is the, um, the, the consequence, right, which is to render men deeply confused about how it is to be a man uh, in, in, with regard to women and also deeply disconnected from what I call their dark masculine, right? So, and many do, deeply disconnected from that predatorial impulse and from um, their own like sexual hunger, their own drive that is the same drive that, you know, is part of how they claim success um, and also how they protect, right? Mm -hmm. And how they um, play this role societally, culturally, at the helm, like I was saying. And when you, when you, you know, disable men in that role, you have a very vulnerable population in the palm of your hand. So it makes sense that there would be a couple of different angles that masculinity has been under siege. And you reference, like, or I reference that feminism is like, a, you know, now it's many decades in the works, right? That that we have been led to imagine that what we want is men cowering and apologizing. My body will never feel safe in a world where men are cowering and apologizing. So I've been led to believe that's what I want. It's not what I want. It's absolutely not what I want. I want dominant men who are, you know, connected to their discernment, to their hearts, who have a lot of experience honing their integrity, making decisions. That's actually what I want. That's what my system is designed for, right? Mm -hmm. So that I can be liberated to what mine is designed for, connection, creative expression, nurturance, right? This polarity and the neutralization of this polarity is underway, obviously, in, in, more, in more ways than we've even discussed. And I think it's, you know, you got to appreciate the evil genius behind the quote unquote evil genius behind all of this, because um, it's really worked in ways to render us confused and to um, deeply disrupt, if not render impossible, the free energy technology that is the man woman dyad in erotic, you know, dynamic. Mm -hmm. And you know, what comes out of that space, right? Like when a woman is, uh, is is serving her man with her heart energy and a man is, you know, protecting in 
sacred dominance, that woman, there is that God comes through that portal, right? And and this is what, you know, data talks about finding sex through God and how you must graduate these different stages to get to a place where you have a prayer of accessing that. And, you know, we talked about the loose ritual idea, but, you know, that kind of ecstasy is the greatest rebellion if that if it's true that this is a recycling bin for you know all all manner of emotional misery that's being like farmed by mm -hmm. you know some on high i don't know obviously this is a pretty dystopian perspective and you know it, you know when i read a book like exit the cave or whatever like there's there's something that feels true about it right like i don't know a lot of happy fulfilled people right like and i look at you know animals eating animals and people eating animals and suffering and destruction and death and and is that what we're here to experience and then there's you know these opportunities to feel that um and and, and to consciously engage the technology of ecstasy and um all it takes is two human bodies right like right present to each other and in their polarized lanes so that's why i've become really focused and and come back to some of my psychiatric roots and i had a very freudian uh, training you know to see like what might be the origins of this um you know assault on eros if you will uh because it's yes it's in the man woman diet i'm very interested in that but it's also with ourselves right where where we are triangulated against our own life force and i use the word eros to refer to like vital force energy the animating principle right excuse me <coughs> and you know all that it takes is to look at the original triangle right like when we're raised as kids and these impulses come through us like whether it's as an infant you know you're nursing and you bite your mom's nipple or um, you know, you're jumping on the couch or you're, you know, touching your body in ways that feel good, or you're just crying and making a lot of noise, right? The response that has been socially sanctioned is stop, <laughs> right? Stop that, mm -hmm. right? Stop doing you, right? Like mm -hmm. stop whatever this impulse is, not only is it bad and wrong, but now there's the the social control grid of shame is activated, right? And so powerful. And the um, relegating of all of those impulses that naturally come through you that result in consequences and punishment into, you know, the shame gated region of your consciousness, you know, is, is I think, the root of so much suffering, if not all of it. And the um, the impairment of our you know, interpersonal um, power structures, like in, the impeding of that. And, you know, that's what renders us controllable. When we think that our desires are bad and wrong, when we think that this animating, you know, force inside of us is a problem, we are disconnected from ourselves. We are disconnected from our own vital force. And of course, it's easy then to be recruited by a system that says, let me save you from your body, your bad body. And, you know, I've talked to, I interviewed this woman, River, on my podcast, and she talks about even like, like who's talking about boner shame, right? Like she talks <laughs> about this concept, right? Of like, you know, because like now in the zeitgeist, like if you're a woman and your body is like all juiced up, like I could be walking down the street, you know, like dripping you know and and that's celebrated right like i'm an embodied woman but if you think about and obviously you know more about this than i do but like if you think about what it is to be a man with an animated body right like you your cock is not allowed to move two centimeters your entire you know um in 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 trainment in school where most often you have like a female telling you what to do and to sit in place when you should be like out you know throwing sticks around and, and killing things or whatever you do. <laughs> and, you know, then you're supposed to like have like a rock hard cock the moment you get in the bedroom, right? Like mm -hmm. that is, 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 is like a major part of how we disembody men, right? We say like what your body does naturally is, is shameful. Like don't, don't, don't get caught, you know, like with your body moving at the wrong time. I mean, that's like, there's there's so many ways that as a recovering feminist, I have come to understand that the plight of men <laughs> is actually in so many ways, if it, it, if it is comparative, which is probably not, um, more challenging, right? And, and it's also because I think Data would say this too, like the masculine requires initiation, 
right? In in ways that the the feminine does not. And absent that initiation, um, which now, I mean, I, there's so few cultures with the hegemony of American, you know, I don't know, practices and ways of being like this, just where, who is initiating men anywhere, right? Anymore. Mm-hmm. And absent right. that, you know, how, how do you become a man? Like, how yeah. do you do it? And I mean, it's, it's probably in ways like why you felt that stirring to go, you know, you call it wanderlust, but maybe it was even um, this, this call to self initiate in ways that would not have been available, like under the gaze of your, your family of origin. And I think that until we reclaim that culturally, um, gosh, it's, it's really challenging <laughs> for, for mm-hmm. men to orient to themselves, um, orient to failure um, in a way that serves them um, and orient to the women in their lives and let alone, you know, their, their, their woman uh, in, in this reclamation of Eros, as I, as I call it. And it's true, you know, it's true for, for on, bo- on both sides that we have a lot of work to do. Although my understanding also working with my teacher, Om Rapani, who's a uh, BDSM coach uh, and, and teaches like dominant, you know, male uh, teachings or whatever, is that men don't need a lot of help being in their heart, right? Like, right, like you you natively have access to your heart and your emotions. You don't need training. You don't need to try. Like what you may, might need help with or what men might need help with is the reorientation around like what it is to have a spine, right? And like what it is to be in touch with that predatory. I call it predatory. People don't like when I use that word, but I don't know. To me, it just comes naturally. Like that predatory claim, like on your, on the things that are yours, right? In your life, right? Um, And making that not only okay, but actually sanctioned. Whereas, you know, we have a lot of work getting back into our bodies, opening our hearts, right? Like, you know, my masculine defensive structure is, is, too well honed, right? Like my spine in ways is is too strong. And this frontal softening has been, you know, the work of um, this coming home to my body has been the work of, you know, the past several years and it should never have been work, right? It should never have required work. Um, so in, in ways like the condition socially for men can be set and then men are gonna be fine, right? It's like the PSYOP has to be undone and then y'all are gonna be fine. We we have, uh, I think, as women, to come together um, and integrate a lot and reorient and and really extinguish a lot of reflexive behaviors that end up rendering our lives less safe. And that includes reorganizing, criticizing, micromanaging men, imagining that we know better. I mean, it can be as simple as like, you know, t- the the driving test, right? Like, anytime a woman is in a car with a man, right? Like, how suppressed is your impulse to tell him how to drive? differently. It should be extinguished entirely, right? He's actually literally metaphorically, he's driving the damn vehicle, right? Like let him do it, let him fail, let him make his, you know, proper mistakes and learn from them. You chose to be in the passenger seat, right? (laughs) And so, I mean, it's like a silly metaphor, but a lot of it, you can, know, gets exposed um, in these like mundane ways. Mm -hmm. And so I I do think that, and, and we are, you know, we are coming together and discussing these things. We are recognizing that feminism has um, offered very limited gains for us uh, and that we don't feel fulfilled. We feel tired. Um, we feel disoriented and we feel um, in deep desire of what, you know, my teacher calls containment from, you know, from the men of the world. Mm. Um, it seems that people say opposites attract, but it seems it's more that polarities attract because mm-hmm. if you're too opposing, if you're too different and you don't have the same habits and opinions and um, uh, hobbies, at least to some degree, it becomes pretty difficult to get along. But polarity is different than opposition. And you'll see even in homosexual relationships that there's still the opposing masculine or feminine role is what is attracting the other person because two feminine women or two masculine men or whatever the dynamic is you almost never see it you always see a there's one of them that's more feminine or one that's more masculine and of course in traditional relationships it's going to be that way as well but with the advent of the whole lg whatever and uh and feminism <laughs> um it's 
made it so that the ideal is that both parties tend towards the middle. Yes. And for me, with most things in life, coming from a, you know, a Buddhist, Taoist, um, are kind of my ideals as far as philosophically speaking, the, those two philosophies and how they always speak towards the middle ground and trying to unify the yin and the yang and not going to extremes for things, it, it always speaks to me um, personally. But when I think of the male, female, or masculine, feminine dynamic and how it all works, I think it's this one opportunity that nature gives us to be extreme in our masculine, in whatever we are. So what I'm saying is that in a relationship, in the male-female dynamic, there's that triangle where it's, um, you know, one is the masculine, one is the feminine, and the balance or the attraction comes from those polarities. And in fact, the greater your extreme is, the more masculine a man you can be, or the more feminine a woman you can be, the more attractive that's going to be. And it's going to be the most feminine, the most fit, friendly, submissive, uh, beautiful, attractive in, in every way, inside and out women that are going to attract and get with and be able to to pair with the most macho, uh, successful, alpha, you know, money making, muscles, what all, all the, you know, all the factors that go into making uh, a real man's man, and it should be that way. I like seeing a real masculine man. Mm. And and he has the trophy wife, mm -hmm. and 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 they get along together. They deserve each other, and it's great. And it's like the the end game of the competition between male and female is to pair those people together because they belong yeah. together. And if you can't, if you know, if you keep getting rejected or whatever, and you're not getting the caliber that you think you deserve, maybe you're over. <laughs> um, maybe you think you're higher on the the social status ladder than you actually are and you you know you're getting humbled and you just need to work your way up um, by developing yourself as more of a man and so what i'm saying is in the male female dynamic that is is man's opportunity to become as manly as possible because that is how we compete for the best women so to speak if you want to word it that way yeah. and that that is um, beautiful. It's a great thing. It's or you called it the um, like a rite of passage, or the th we don't have like when you're turning 13, 14, like the old tribes would have some kind of event, a very difficult thing mm -hmm. um, th that the the boy has to overcome. And after this thing, this challenge, uh, you know, he's taken away from his mother. Sometimes in the middle of the night, and some of these rituals by the older men, and then he's put it in some situation that is, you know, by modern Western standards was probably be, would probably be called abusive. And then <laughs> he's having to work his way out of the situation. And there ever after he's he's changed. He's not the boy that can run to his mother um, for help. He had to deal with whatever the the ritual was on his own. And it when you don't have that, which we don't in Western society anymore, where is that time when you go from being the pimply, <laughs> you know, <laughs> glasses wearing, video game playing teenager to having some kind of initiating event where you feel that, you know, okay, now I'm a man. Now I can begin this process that I was just talking about of masculine, masculinizing yourself yeah. <laughs> so that you can become more attractive to the feminine. And, and not just be this pimply teenager that's focused on whatever a, a, young, a young man is, is focused on before he gets into this game of, of, of relationships and attracting. And that also is only part of it, because that's, say, in your 20s, 30s, whatever, is that competition, that coming into your, your masculine or for women coming into your, your feminine. Once you find your, your one, um, now it's about for the man it's about being a provider and a protector and and a leader and for the woman it's it's about making a space and and uh being a supportive <clears throat> um 
homemaker and fa uh, looking after the family and everything, the roles start to change, but they're still, they're based on what you were developing uh, before that. The masculine um, man now has to be the providing protector, not the predator who's going out and trying to conquer. Because if you continue that, now you're a cheater. Now you're right. going to have multiple families and kids out of wedlock, and you're going to be creating a lot of misery uh, in your wake. And that's not a very masculine thing to do. The masculine thing to do once you've made a decision, as in getting married and or having children, is to follow through with it and be the best husband slash father that you can be. Um, so there's stages as well in masculinity right. and femininity, femininity, which we don't have initiatory necessarily rights for. I guess marriage should be that, but it's the, as an institution has become so degraded that now something like 50% of them end up failing. And it, it, I don't think it's the institution's fault. You know, okay. marriage is still a wonderful thing. It's us in 2023 that have changed and devolved so much in this way that our polarities are no longer attracting each other because men are being taught that, oh, women should pay for the first date and you need to be in touch with your feelings and you should cry in front of your women and all these things. And then we try it out <clears throat> and women are and women are like, yeah, yeah, do that, do that. And then they see it and then they're like, oh, that's <laughs> repulsive. <laughs> and then, then, they, then they realize only too late that what they actually wanted was that stoic bad boy, you know, and that, well, there's another, um, you know, calling it the bad boy. Why is why do all women want the bad boy? It's obviously not bad if everyone wants it. So it's been pathologized. Certain masculine traits, toxic masculinity, have been uh, labeled as negative, and but and and so they're disappearing in the world, and <clears throat> becoming more difficult to, for women to find. And then when they do, they're, you know, wondering why they're getting ghosted by Chad. You know, <laughs> it's because they're all going after the 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 bad boys, so to speak, the alpha toxic masculine who have succeeded in this game I'm talking about of competition between men of being the most masculine man you can be in society. That game is bad. So the winners are bad boys. But are they? No, they're right. just. They're just tough alpha dudes. They're the cool guys. They're the people I was just talking about that deserve the best women. And I like seeing them together. You know, the, the alpha Chad with the 10 babe on his shoulder. It's like, yes, humanity at work. You know, we're, <laughs> the human it. game is, is, is in progress. Absolutely. I mean, it's, I, and I, you know, because I will never fully recover from my conspiracy theorist um, nature. You know, the, 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 the meta of this is, is massive because what you're referencing is the ultimate dialectic, right? It's like if we, if we think of all these Hegelian dialectics, all these polarities, right? All of these seemingly irreconcilable differences between, you know, the, the, you know, the the race racist and the social justice fighter between, you know, the, the mask wear and the not, you know, between the, the, the flat and round earther between, you know, the, the, the feminist and the, you know, red pill dude, right? These um, seeming, you know, um, I don't know, enemies, if you will, this, this is the heart of victim consciousness, right? Like you need the bad villain, you need the bad other, you need to dehumanize, you need to imagine that you are superior. And what you and I are talking about is assuming proper organized energetics, the yin yang, assuming polarity. And what what arises phenomenologically from that space is complementarity. It's like magic. It's like the impossible that both of these totally diverse interests could be served simultaneously when people come together, being their totally different selves with minimal overlap right? How is that possible? And that's why I think that this, what we're talking about and the reclamation of it is the model for how, you know, if, if I, if I am unwilling to wear a mask on my face and I'm invited to dinner because this actually happened, um, mm -hmm. by friends who insisted that I do so, 
they feel safe with a mask on my face. I feel unsafe with a mask on my, that's irreconcilable. There's no yeah. dinner happening, right? The yeah. dinner did not occur. So like, what do we do? Do we just silo off into our superior cult of wokeness, right? Like, or, or do we just tolerate and supplicate or like make compromises? That doesn't work. We already talked about that, right? So my needs are my needs. So how does this work? And, and I think of it as sort of like the, in the whole obiont of like the human being, there's like all of these different tissues that are organized in their discrete roles, right? So like, you know, the liver, actually one of my colleagues disabused me of the concept of cells. So apparently cells don't like exist the way we thought they were, but whatever, let's say cells for the purpose of the, this conversation. So the liver cells are here, the eye cells are here, whatever. They have to organize you know, in their proper spaces in order to serve the whole, right? So like, what if there is a model for ending controversy, for disrupting this dialectic phenomenon that is essential for our own disempowerment and worse? And it is understanding that there is such a thing as, you know, complementarity that arises once you understand your role, your needs, you're honest and real about your desires, and you trust yourself, right? You trust your desires, you trust your impulses, right? So for me as like a recovering feminist to recognize that I actually want to play this part in a dynamic, um, that I actually want to create the conditions for the men in my life, and not just a partner, to succeed, you know, it's very humbling, right? But it's, it's also not because it's how I get what I want. Right. So, you know, I, I started to practice, I don't know what, two years ago or a year and a half ago, where I committed um, to what my teacher calls making every man bigger. Right. So, you know, like I would I would love to give a little test case. Right. And share with you, like um, authentically that, like when I speak to my daughters, I say, you know, if you ever need information about anything, because it's hard to Google things, go to Eric Dubay's website, right? Because what he has to say is truth to me, right? Like literally everything he has to say. And it's amazing that one person has contributed this like to the world. And I'm so grateful and so appreciative, you know, that you exist, that you speak, you know, your mind and you do so with, with, a masculine energetic, right? That you are self-possessed, that you're chill, you're calm. And like, I don't see you getting like a lot of, you know, so-called flat earthers get their panties in a bunch about stuff. And it's a disservice, right? As men, especially whatever. So like, I would share that with you because I want you to know that I appreciate you authentically. Right. And I have a practice of doing this with, with my gardener, you know, with a guy who like helps me carry a bag, like with every man I encounter, Whereas I am coming from a place where as an adaptive response, I would shit talk pretty much all men all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like, and maybe not always intentionally, but including my partners. And this is how women have found safety with each other and offered like surrogate levels of containment to each other um, is by, you know, really imagining that when we understand how bad and wrong men are and we know better than them, then we're safe. But it's not worked. It's not worked, you know, and our systems are are frazzled and, and frayed and we long for something that we have been told we shouldn't want. Right. So it's like the same as like, you know, jumping on the couch or, you know, touching your body as a five-year-old or whatever, like you shouldn't do that, right? You shouldn't want that, you know, what, what you, what's animating you is bad um, and shameful. And so this, this, this full circle moment, um, it's, it's, it's humbling, but then it's also, it's kind of like, it's, it's fun. I mean, one of the teachers that I really like, although she won't come on my podcast, I think it's because of how I've run my mouth about pandemic stuff or whatever. But anyway, um, she uh, wrote a book called The Surrendered Wife, Laura Doyle. And her primary credential is that she had a really shitty marriage. And now she has an amazing marriage. <laughs> but she's trained like, you know, I don't know what dozens, if not hundreds of of coaches. She doesn't believe in marital counseling. And her thing is any marriage can be saved, right? And it it does not require the man to do one minute of work. He doesn't even have to know what's going on. 
and you engage these intimacy skills, she calls them, and they're like really basic. Like you don't take the bait of telling your man how to um, do things, right? So even if, because he's potentially still recovering from a lot of these social constructs and mommying his partner, or rendering her, you know, his mom or whatever, like he might say like, Hey honey, like, should I paint the garage like on Wednesday or Friday? And you, you literally don't answer. And she gives you these phrases. I think I'm not supposed to be telling you this, but whatever. She gives you these phrases (laughs) and they're like, you know, whatever you think, whatever you think, or like, that's a great question because that's how you confer respect to a man. And you lead him into his masculine. Exactly. You you show him that uh, I want you to make these decisions yes, and that you come can. to me for him. And so and he's deferring him. to you because a, a lot of times we as men are told that <clears throat> or we get that drilled into us that we need to check with our woman first. Yeah. Where, where, where do you want to go? Well, well, what do you want to eat? Well, uh, <laughs> And the more you are like that, actually, the less they're going to want to offer <laughs> their opinions. Uh, they would, you know, in general, a feminine woman would like it more if the masculine man knew exactly what he would like while taking his woman into consideration, knowing what, what she likes to do, what she likes to eat as well, and then saying, here's the plan, and then just laying it out. And if the woman had some big issue with it, I'm sure she could say, well, you know, I'd really not like to do that. And she would rather do that than have it all thrown on her and say, well, what would you like to do? Well, I'm fine. Because a lot of times we feel or we're being taught that that is the masculine role. Like the masculine role is to be whatever, to, to be okay with whatever. But that's, that's submissive. That's the definition exactly. of being submissive. Exactly so right. no, that, that's what the woman's, women should be stepping more into that role of being okay with whatever. Rather than always thinking, well, but I want to watch this movie. Well, but I really wanted to go to this restaurant. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, that's fine. And, and of course, you'll, your opinion is going to be taken into consideration. But uh, what you're probably looking for is a leader that leads so well that you rarely ever question the leadership and you just go along with it and are so happy that you chose the right leader. Yes. Because that, yes, that is it. the one thing that the women really have. Yeah is because they say women are the gatekeepers of sex and men are the gatekeepers Mm -hmm. of relationships in the sense that uh, Mm -hmm. most women can can get most men in bed but can they keep them in their house afterwards is the 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 test and so if you if you can't then it may be because of some of these dynamics uh, one way or the other that the the man is stepping too far into his feminine or the woman too far into the masculine and the polarities are making people so disattracted uh, that it's to the state now where it's like um, men think that, well, equality, feminism, the gender pay gap and everything. So when you go out for the first date, 50-50, always. Right. Or sometimes it's like first date, well, we'll go to a park then and, right. and we'll, we'll walk around the park. And women are just like, ugh, oh, you're going to take me to a park or go to a coffee or, or you know or when the bill comes and it's 50 50 all she's seeing is okay so you're not not a leader you're not a provider you're not uh, you know making these kind of decisions even when because <laughs> women will say that they want that but then you can see them being actually repulsed by it because Hopefully. they're only saying they want it because of the whole feminist narrative it's it's indoctrination like you said, when you were in that room of 2,000 people and you said the the, the, the thing that would allow the women to um, sit back in their feminine and they all just kind of groaned because it's like they knew, like, oh, yes, this is the thing that we're not supposed to want that, of course, we all want. Yeah. Um, exactly. I think that- and when we're confused about this, this is the issue. Like, when we are confused about this, we choose partners based on the wrong criteria, if there's such a thing as wrong, I mean, whatever, Mm -hmm. it's all as it's meant to be. However, like, you know, if, if in this rubric you're describing in exactly the way that I would, you know, the most important thing for me to identify in a partner is that I have chosen a man I respect, right? Not that I find hot, not that whatever, that respect is at the, the apex of my priorities. And if, 
if I'm not getting that as a man, that is the number one thing that's going to make me not want to be in the relationship yes. anymore as well. Yes, my my most like viral um, video in my entire career um, in the in the like millions is a like a whiteboard video <laughs> that I did based on what I learned about this, which is that like again because I'm interested in resolving victimhood, right? So infidelity is a big one it's like huge one right and so so I, it was like a day i was like out um in austin and i had like two married men like i don't know like a, a hit on me or whatever you want to say right like you know give me their information and come up to me one is like a coffee shop and the other was like a colleague i was like this is really disturbing and so i felt also like so much for these these women right like this projection and just like empathy for these their women and and um, and of course, then I'm like, shit, why am I attracting this? Like, this is also reflecting something like about me, <clears throat> whatever. So I got into a twist and I really considered it. And I was like, no, 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 there's no fucking victims. And, you know, these women, I bet they can pinpoint when they lost respect for these men. I bet they know, right? I can do that in my own relationship history. And at that point, you know, there is a sourcing, right? You could call it narcissistic supply if you want, or it's a meeting of basic needs that these men will do from other women, even if it's not sexualized or romanticized or whatever. It's just for respect, attention, a sense of admiration, mm -hmm. right? They will source from other women and then it will be called the bad behavior, right? But it's the same as allopathy. It's like, are we blaming the symptom without any consideration of the root cause driver? Are we even right. curious about mm -hmm. how this is a, a, a an emergent phenomenon rather than this like random shitty thing that's happened? And so, you know, this is why if, if women know that the men that they choose should be the men, the man they respect most in their life, that's your partner, right? Like, then we can create these dynamics and sustain and, and nurture them. And then your relationship becomes a literal contribution to this sacred field on this plane. You know, like it's it's just a totally different orientation than what becomes available through, you know, the, the mother-son archetype and the father-daughter archetype and the recruitment of all of our trauma field, you know, attempts to buy eggs from the hardware store. Mm, yeah. And so if men developed themselves purposely towards being the most respectful, respectable, responsible versions of themselves, then that is what should and would attract the most respectful women. And if women are sourcing their guys on, who, you know, who do I feel, you know, the most respect for? And what if men did the same with women? They're called pick I think, as yeah. a <laughs> derogatory term nowadays but the whichever woman in your life is acting <laughs> pick me the most probably means that she is respectful towards you and and respects you and the reason other women label her that is because they <laughs> they're jealous of the dynamic that they see between her and whatever guy is is she's picking mm -hmm. um and i think that um well, I don't like that term. It's just the term I hear all the time. But a girl that's displaying those qualities towards you, in other words, being submissive and showing that uh, they're interested, you know, women are the least like, likely in the dynamic to show that. It's always the guy that goes and shows interest and tries to get the date and everything. But that means the guy's always going in there blind and it gives the woman the upper hand all the time and the guy never really knows where he stands. Um, whereas if but like I said, the women are the gatekeepers of relationships in the first place. So if she knows who the guy is that she wants, um, you know, as a woman, you, there's there's ways of going after what you want and still being feminine about it. But I, I think um, of course it's that, yeah, that being be, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, not necessarily going right out there and going down on one knee and uh, <laughs> to that degree, but. Um, making the man you are interested in aware that that you are um, and treating him accordingly, it would be so much easier than playing hard to get and rejecting everyone outright and being the, the bad big boss bitch that seems to be the persona that's being um, offered to women as being like the, the way you should be is like 
stuck up and snobby and holier than thou to everyone, including the man you most want. Mm. <laughs> and thinking that that's somehow going to get you what you want. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, I think in the old days it was called like dropping the handkerchief, right? And I think this, again, not to sound like a a broken record on the PSYOP front, but I, I do think another socially engineered phenomenon is like the sexual liberation, you know, agenda and um, what it is to imagine that we can neutralize the experience of casual sexuality. Uh, you know, maybe this started in the 60s, let's say, and then was really um, fueled by birth control, right? So now if the one risk for women is no longer a, a risk, now we are on an equal playing field and we can take sex from each other, you know, whenever we want. And part of what, you know, I think has happened is that, that people are having less sex, actually. Um, they're less sexually fulfilled. And the the destruction is maybe a strong word, but disturbance at least of like the monogamous um diet and the, the power they're in to serve sexual fulfillment specifically is just like, even that sentence is probably like <laughs> triggered, you know, like <laughs> a lot of people, right? So, so what, it, what I've come to just out of curiosity is like, I call it the reclamation of courtship, <clears throat> but it's like, what if, just what if, I don't know, um, women do not have sex <laughs> with men, right? So hookup culture is like immediately arrested in its development. So until and if there is claim, like what if, right? You know, I'm like really into, I didn't watch TV for a long, long, long time when I was in my workaholism, activism moment for a decade. And, and then I got really into this show, Outlander, which I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's Oh, I'm thinking Highlander. I only know Highlander with the, the swords. No, I don't know Outlander. Well, this one is is, is about Similar. Scottish Highlanders, actually. But so maybe you're <laughs> it's like in your consciousness. But anyway, it's like it's it's like a you know it's sort of like a it's a it's a love story. Oh, my, but it's... my mom's into this. Yeah, yeah. She, there's there's books. <laughs> Me and, and your mom. Obviously, she's read all the books and <laughs> yes. Now that, so it's super. I know well it sounded fit. familiar. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. But it's also very well. You know, it's like in my in my moment of rejecting everything that I decided was like, you know, F MK ultra fueled or whatever. Like I, I lost the appreciation for the art, right? The, the creative energy that is captured in these realms. Like it, it, I mean, it's actually like a masterpiece. Um, why am I talking about it? Oh, because, yes, yeah, of course. Yeah, thank you. Because I like got lost in a reverie about Jamie Fraser, yeah. but uh, <laughs> the, 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 the experience that these, you know, it's a, it's it's the best example of a polarized relationship. Like I think is that's in modern media, um, and they, you know, they actually get married before they even ever kiss, right? Of course, it's like I don't know what fourteen hundred Scotland or whatever is <laughs> dismiss it. But like, what if there are elements there, or even in denominational religion where there's like a matchmaker and whatever? What if there are elements there that we can consider, just consider, um, for, you know, in service of our own needs right this is not like you know to to just exercise like some masochistic impulse right like it's like this would be in service of what it is that we we say we need and that's why i think like our relationship to sexuality but specifically the 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 energetic cost of the the dimensions of our persona that are tied in with that sexual energy that life force energy that are behind the shame wall you know like i've been celibate for almost two years and in this window i have literally had like a creative explosion right like in my life right like and reclaimed a lot of like childhood you know singing and dancing and sewing and you know raising these animals and just it's um it's translated, right? And during this time, I've done a lot of work on my sexual shame and even body shame stuff or whatever. It's such an expensive currency shame. And when you can work with that and reclaim the dimensions of yourself, you know, that you've projected and judged on the outside, right? So if you just think about like, you know, for me, it would be like the women that I I always judged on social media with their like, you know, cleavage out or scantily clad or like just unprofessional or, um, you know, too much makeup, or I'm trying to think of like whatever. Uh, that judgment is the is the portal 
through which I can meet these rejected dimensions of myself and also understand what I would like to have permission to experience too, right? Like maybe I also want to be and, and have been since in, a, in my own interpersonal <laughs> like experiment, um, you know, the woman in a bikini on Instagram, right? When I had only ever allowed myself to be like the professional in the white coat who like never used profanity and was always ready, you know, to, to play that part. Um, so in this kind of a work space, we, we liberate energy and that energy then goes to creating, right? Like, cause what are we going to do? Just like fight all the lies forever, right? <laughs> like, right. And stomp our feet, like petulant kids, or are we, are we going to reclaim this creative energy, do it together, right? In, in, in relationship, in community and actually explore like what it is that we want like what kind of a world do we want to live in right mm -hmm. and i mean you you have a blank slate now like having come back to america after all this time like right like what do you want like what it's 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 a paralyzing question sometimes you know um and we would rather not engage the infinity of choices right like we'd rather be many of us at least i think women especially like constrained um and limited and there's a way to engage that consciously right to engage like conscious constraint or you know like when i first um I, I started pole dancing and when i first started pole dancing i was so expanded by this and a lot of women experience a lot of resolution of like sex shame through through this like now archetypal practice and i like injured my ribs like bad <laughs> right in because it's very like a, athletic and and whatever and i wasn't properly like trained. I was just too mm. enthusiastic and I injured myself and I couldn't dance for like two months. And it's like, look, I'm, I subconsciously manifested this constraint because I don't actually know how to hold the expansion. And we do this with money. You know, we do this with all of the complaints that we have in our lifescape about how things are not going the way we want them to. And the truth is our shadow desires are for them to be exactly that. At least that's what I think. And so, you know, we can, um, we can engage life this way, semi-consciously, subconsciously, or we can understand that there are dynamics, there's structures, right? Like there may be agreements, contracts, right? That we can consciously engage so that we feel, you know, ordered. And then we get to <laughs> play, right? Like we get to have whatever we want. And I think this conversation, it's like we can't really, I don't know, I mean, maybe you can um, see what's possible yet, right? Like we're just, we're so much in, in the, <laughs> the loose ritual of like, this sucks, you know, this is not what it should be, um, on, on a hundred levels. And I'm going to make sure people know about that. <laughs> right. like, it's been my entire career for a long time. <laughs> the, the whole hookup culture, I think it's the, I mean, men, you know, it, when, when the idea is presented to men as a whole, they're just going to be like, Okay, sounds good to us. So it's difficult for us to be the ones that are going to say no to hookup culture. But like you said, when the reclamation of courtship, it's the women are really the ones that uh, it's easier for you to say no. Um, it's more your place to say no as you're the, what would you say, you're the female unit of the you know, the, the physical <laughs> thing that's happening here, you know, we're trying to go, you're, yeah. you're the one deciding these kind of things. So as a natural uh, role, if the women stepped more back into... <laughs> into I'm going to make you do a whiteboard demo of all. <laughs> um, it's going to go viral, don't worry, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> body count has become this this big talking point now because of the this whole sexual liberation you know, like I said, the guys, we're not going to be out here on the front lines with picket lines saying to stop no, women's <laughs> sexual liberation because it's all, it's all good for us. But it's not because what we're seeing on the other side of it is this over concern with body count and things like this, which is coming from the fact that now with overly sexual liber liberalism in 2023, it's almost impossible to find a virgin or, or to find someone that um, has that, that isn't of this mindset. And so, yeah, we can sleep with with all the women. But then when the guys are ready to to find a wife, especially right. in the, say, 20 something category, which is the age which most men are looking to wife someone up, 
the women of that age are in their feminist female empowerment, let's rack up a body count stage where they're exploring themselves and this kind of thing. Um, so it's like, like everything else in society, I think is it's been degraded now and so easy, easily accessible that now we don't even want it. Because actually now with sexual liberation at its peak, we're having less sex than before. If you look right. at the surveys, I think you mentioned it. Um, uh, pe people, it was, I think it was something like 12% previously of people that uh, would like to be having sex but aren't, and it's up to 17. I can't remember the numbers. I was just watching it. But in other words, in this um, age of sexual liberation, we're, we're having less sex and we're not staying together um, with our mates, like I said, the 50% divorce rate. So if we re-commodified sex coming from the women's standpoint, and you're also talking about looking for the man they most respect, this is how it's been throughout all of history. Right. So rather than just being like, well, he's alpha, he's a bad boy, he looks good for tonight, whatever, really, um, cherishing that aspect of femininity um, might be more the way to go than just racking up the body count and then trying to figure out uh, which which guy I'm going to respect now that I've got 50 <laughs> behind me type of thing. And then same thing with the guys who we're, like I said, we're just seeing that, oh, easy. Okay, so women now it's just as easy as uh, going to a party and, and wait until they've had enough beers and they're everything's fine because they're on birth control and that's how they're planning to live their life anyway that's how the hookup culture seems to work it's like put yourself in the right position a compromisable position you know with the right amount of alcohol at night in you know uh, dim lights whatever and <laughs> that seems to be it's like a, a game rather than a what do you call it the like a ceremony or, or reclamation of courtship you know that word courtship Nobody even talks about that. Even the word dating, people say like nobody dates anymore. Dating was a, a downgrade from courtship. Now right. people don't even go on dates anymore because it's just hookup. So you're not even uh, on a, an item. Uh, you don't even have to be a girlfriend or boyfriend, whatever that means in today's day, day and age. Um, but you're saying like in the 1400s, Scotland, they wouldn't even kiss until they're married. Um, think of the difference between value. It's like in the consumer economy where you can buy anything, but nothing, everything breaks instantly. and It doesn't hold any value. You don't even want anything. It's worthless. Well, it's the same thing with us, not very masculine men and the not very feminine women. So we're all there on the marketplace looking at each other like, well, there's a lot here in the marketplace, but I don't want to buy anything, really. I'll just I'll rent this one. I'll rent this one for a year. I'll pretend that, you know. And that's what why all the marriages are ending because we're not finding the trophy, you know. The I, it seems that's like a derogatory thing, the trophy wife. But as you said, you you worded it much better than that, or something like the masculine expresses himself through being able to achieve the that a high value woman, the high value yeah. woman, something like that. I think that that makes perfect sense to me, and that's. It's not a negative thing. That's the positive. It's um, reality. <laughs> yes, the yeah. outcome of the the mating yeah. ritual of the courtship game that we're involved in. But I'm just saying, if there's nothing of value for the high, va if there's no high value men and women to come together, then right. everyone's on the marketplace just dissatisfied in this mess that we have now, where people aren't um, building themselves up into high value people and instead just trying to kind of whore themselves onto the market and see what they can come up with. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we are ripe for, you know, like, like AI bot sex and like extra uterine pregnancies and, you know, all sorts of gender bending. And, you know, you can track it back to an, the uninitiated man in some ways, right? Because if, if a man cannot handle this is just one nuance, but like cannot handle rejection because he does not want, as you were saying earlier, that kind of experience of being tested because he associates it with his mommy, you know, being critical of him. And it just feels existentially destabilizing. Right. Mm. A man who is not initiated doesn't have a relationship to failure 
that is stable and curious and healthy, right? He doesn't understand that that's actually, this is actually one of the reasons, because I've been very interested in the, sorry, and I'm going on a non sequitur, but the trauma-based origins of why people won't look into cosmology, right? Mm -hmm. And why people who have been raised in the globe model and the heliocentric model are are confronted by somebody in their life who has awakened to you know a true earth cosmology and is is curious about you know geocentrism or whatever it is and there's hysteria right we've all experienced that probably you mm -hmm. have like many videos on this phenomenon right and i have been curious especially in men if that's a lot of like father woundology right because if you haven't matured your inner masculine it is so threatening that you might be have you know you might be wrong and you might have been wrong right about this massive thing bigger than anything else um and you just can't sustain it, right? So, so that all of your defenses kick in, and you get, you know, your your feminine is unbridled and uncontained, and that's why there's like hysteria, right? Like I've seen this so many times in men, like it's just like a, like wild emotionality around this, and so the man uninitiated cannot relate with curiosity to his own failures, understanding that's part of being a man is like mm. feeling like you're failing, as far as I understand, largely through David Data, all the time, right? You <laughs> succeed and succeed and succeed, and you still feel failure, right? Like it, you look for it almost. Um, and it's, it's almost like an erotic relationship to, to the failure itself, the experience of failure. It's, it's part of the masculine like principle, right? So, so, so here you are, you're, you, you, you're vulnerable to rejection in hookup culture, right? Cause even if you make it easier with booze and whatever else, like you still got to approach a lot of women. You don't have that security of monogamy, right? Like the woman who says she wants you and is is ready to give it to you, right? You got to keep trying, right? And the, re the rejection potential is huge there. And then you sprinkle in pornography and, you know, the, the cuckolding of men the world over who are, you know, literally choosing to watch other men, you know, have sex with, with women instead of having their own sex with women. And, and you've created the conditions for a breakdown in the drive, right? And in the ingredients um, they're in. And, and, and then you just enter, like offer a sex bot, <laughs> right? Who's never going to reject you and is going to do whatever you want and give you a little sense of that safe alpha energy, right? Like no re rejection free, like alpha zone. And, you know, we have the dismantling of this, again, like sacred portal to the divine. Like it's, I don't know. There, there's there's some some folks who have great psychological mastery <laughs> uh, at the helm of a lot of these socially engineered phenomena that we imagine just organically emerged from the populace. You know. Mm -hmm. Can you speak more about the how this relates to cosmology and how uh, what you've noticed uh, as a psychiatrist the the knee jerk reaction of most people when they come across these fringe subjects like the flat earth, their geocentric cosmology, and not only knee jerk, but defensive and offensive to the yeah. point that you will cut off family members uh, over issues like this. So many people are having marriages and the, you know, father, son, mother, daughter relationships uh, destroyed just because one of them says, I think the earth is flat. Like what is going on there? You know. Yeah, I mean, you've you've spoken to it in a way in your videos that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and I've been wondering myself because, you know, I get as a provocateur, professional provocateur, I get myself into a lot of controversial arenas. So, you know, I have seen like, for example, I don't believe in germ theory or contagion or infection and um, the, the whole paradigm. I don't part participate in it. And obviously, you know, when it comes to pharmaceuticals and, you know, like I've been called all sorts of things about like, you know, related to my beliefs. Um, but, but the subjects that have been most inflammatory are, are the one we've been discussing this whole time. So like the feminist realm, um, and, and where women, I think feel uh, I'm abandoning them. Right. Like, and, and cause it's not men who are upset. It's, it's women who are upset. And, and I get it. I do get, I would, feel the same way, I think. Um, and the the cosmology realm where I have, I mean, because right, like in this radical inquiry 
space um, collegially, right? MDs and scientists and whatever, we're asking the big questions and we've we've broken through, you know, the virus illusion or whatever. And, and you would imagine everything's up for exploration, everything. Mm. But there's this, this dialectic emerging where there are the folks who have questioned and are willing to question everything, whether it's like evolution and dinosaurs, nuclear weapons, you know, all the things, um, inclusive of the solar system, right? We're just, yeah, like it makes sense that all the seven sciences were probably based in engineered constructs of reality. And there's a lot of agenda, you know, driven um, phenomenology that is the same. Like when you question medicine and you you wake up to the cult of medicine, like it's, it's the same pattern over and over and over again in all these different arenas. Mm -hmm. So like, why don't people recognize it's the same damn thing? Right. And then there's this other, this other um, declarative group, I get within, <laughs> you know, the, the renegades um, who are really upset, it seems, about this flat earth psyop, right? So this idea that, um, that in, you know, intellectuals in our in our quote unquote our realm are 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 being captured by the psyops to discredit them. And you know, in my case, I've done a great job discrediting myself. Like I don't need any help, you know, from like you know being called a flat earther or whatever. It doesn't like I really don't care. Um, and I what I see is a lot of men who do care. And so my old feminist self would have been, been really like, oh my God, so sad that you're so invested in like what people <laughs> think about you and you're like so superficial and whatever. And now I have a more nuanced perspective, which is to say like your reputation as a man is your like lifeblood, right? Literally. And it's your honor, right? It matters. And in fact, like as a woman, I believe it's like, you know, my male colleagues, one of my roles as a woman is to uphold their reputation, right? So now I get it. Okay, so it's about reputation and about this socially engineered dialectic, where, which I, I think probably there's some false flags coming, but I don't know, like, you know, around the flat earth, you know, it's like the anti-vaxxers, right? Like the, the flat earth and the 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 round earth stuff. Um, so there is that, there's that very real concern, if you will, that, that grown men have about coming into disrepute through association with this, you know, engineered slanderous space or whatever. But then I also wonder if there's more to it, right? Because even like with some colleagues, it's like, it's not a public thing, right? Like when I'm coming out and debating this, so maybe what if nobody knows and still interpersonally, there's all of that, like you were saying with a family member or like brother or whatever, um, there's all of this, resistance. Yeah, you know, it's like a euphemistic way of putting it. Um, what is that about? And all I can figure is like, we have decided that that changing is bad, right? Like we've decided that changing makes the former version of you bad and wrong. So better to stay consistent. Everybody around you wants you to stay consistent. It just seems to be like how we can grasp at certainty is like just stay the same, please. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so if change is like problematic socially, because it makes the previous version of you bad and wrong, um, then you have to sustain that experience of being bad and wrong about something real big. Mm -hmm. And it just depends what your relationship to being bad. I call it wearing the villain crown, like being bad and wrong is right. Like it took me, it still does. <laughs> um, Took me years to 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 integrate my nervous system to the extent where I could hold the energy of somebody experience somebody that I care about experiencing me as bad and wrong, right? So like, if you literally can't hold that energy in your body, then you're going to fight with any possibility of having to engage being bad and wrong on that scale, especially if like somebody's introducing it to you. Um, you just want it to go away, right? Like you want the whole phenomenon to go away. And that's why I, I'm a big believer when it comes to like truthing and truth. My cat, that's the sound that she has <laughs> brought a creature to me. So I can't wait to discover what it is. Um, <laughs> when when you're relating to truth, like I'm sure, you, I know you, you agree with this. Like you can't put it on someone, right? You can't inform anyone, right? So like it's a matter of, um, like a chain of custody of trust, right? So, so the person who opened my eyes to cosmology is somebody that I don't know how she came into my life. Honestly, it's like some sort of 
destined, <laughs> you know, connection um, through, you know, sort of the whole uh, anatomy of this um, COVID experience. Mm. Uh, we, I don't know, maybe through Instagram. I don't know what we we connected, right? And so we were already talking about things and what's going on. And and she is um, a black woman who lives in London. So when the George Floyd um, thing <laughs> occurred, I had I didn't ever watch the video, and I had um, the sense that this was staged, right? Like that the whole thing was staged and crisis actors and the whole thing. And that's my tendency, right? So the shadow of that is that I don't allow myself to co-participate in what the rest of, you know, society is involved in because I don't want to feel like whatever it is that I imagine, you know, I'm going to, so I just wall myself off and I say like, that's a psyop. Like, I understand that there's a shadow to this for sure. But anyway, I had a disagreement at the time with someone important to me in my life over this um, subject. And I went to her you know, as a black woman, I said, listen, like, what do you think of this? How are you feeling about this? And she started to to send me all of these um, links on Instagram of people with handles, like, it's flat, bro, (laughs) or like, (laughs) you know, the truth about the curve or whatever. And I had never, I mean, I only knew um, David Wolf. I don't know if you know him. Um, I'd only ever interacted with him on the subject and like he would interview me and start talking about what you could see from this island in Hawaii or whatever. And I'd be like, who cares? <laughs> like, why this? Why are you embarrassing yourself? Like, just, just stop, please just stop. But not like I, it was fine, but also sort of silly. Like I was like patron, felt patronizing about it, but I didn't see that it mattered, right? Like I didn't see that it was significant. And so when she brought this into my field, I have such regard for this woman, for her intellect, for her depth of research and for the role that she's played in my life, that that was the, 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 you know, the custody of trust. Like it was passed through this, this medium. That's how it works. Right. Like, you know, and, and so in people in their own lives who are speaking to others, you know, maybe they'll use your videos, like as a resource, right. To, to share, but only after that, that, that chain of connection, right, has has been established. Um, and I think, you know, I guess sometimes the, the divergence that occurs, the cosmology thing is just a symptom, right? Like the divergence may be needed, you know, to occur. And it seems like it's about arguing over like whether the earth is flat or round, but it's it's really, um, it as you know, and speak to you, like it's it's a worldview, right? It's, it's, um, metaphysical perspective and not everybody is in the same like resonance if you will and so this is one of the litmus tests i guess but it's also organizing right so when we're talking about like the liver cells and the eye cells like it's just organizing of where um there's going there's complementarity available and i know you know that you probably agree that it would serve us to find ways to discuss this matter right like with people who don't agree, right? And 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 how like I, I wonder how you navigate this, right? So when when somebody says something that I don't agree with, right? So like in casual conversation, right? So like let's say they talk about like having caught a, you know an illness from somebody else, or maybe they talk about like you know galaxies and solar system or whatever. There's a part of me that feels like oh I can't pretend that I'm not here, right? Like, there's a part of me that my I am wants assertion, right? Mm, mm. Um, sometimes I just say nothing. And sometimes I, I have found a way to appease the different parts of me, like, you know, the part that wants to maintain connection, and the part that wants to be allowed to be different. And I'll like make sort of like a joke. And I'll be like, Oh, you know, it's funny. Like, I totally don't believe in that (laughs) or whatever. And like, but okay, go ahead or whatever, you know, like I'll make some sort of like, I don't know, like, and I think you've talked about this too, like just sort of like a a casual, semi-connected sort of like, oh, what do you, you know, here's this kind of Mm. a thing. Um, I don't know. Lay it out on the table and see see what they do next. Yeah, Yeah. But, but maybe there's also a realm of consent if you're serious. Like I think in the collegial world, this is really something, you know, um, my like dear friend um, and ally Tom Cowan, you know, we talk about this all the time. Like, what is the way to introduce? And he's been so outspoken, if that's the word about virology, right? Like, what is the way to introduce information? Like, 
do you ask for consent, right? Do you say like, hey, like, you know, I, I have some thoughts about that, you know, that haven't really come up. Like, let me know if you if you're curious about them, I'd be happy to share. And then at least there's consent there. Um, I don't know. I think this is this is where the real questions lie because until we understand how to come into the energetics, like what do those look, what, what does that polarity look like, mm. right? When it's fully expressed and it's obviously not necessarily erotic. Um, and it is right. The energy is there. That's what I'm talking about. Look at the hysteria that is eros. That is life force energy that is captured by shame. Um, otherwise you wouldn't give a shit, right? If somebody mm. says something you don't agree with and you're super confident in your reality, you literally don't care. They get to be themselves, right? They get to like just live a sovereign being, right? So how do we get to that place? Well, there's a lot of energy like kinked up for us to um, unwind on both sides. Mm -hmm. And I think if we focus again on ourselves and getting developing ourselves to the point that we really don't care what other people think about these subjects or about us for our knowledge of these subjects, and instead we just keep going, you know, rather than worrying about what they're going to think about being the world's leading flat earther, nope, just bury your head in books and keep becoming more so. Or they're saying, get out there and, and do debates, find the, the biggest globe earthers and, and try to debate with them about it. And I, I gave the analogy of preaching to the choir and singing so loudly that passersby just want to come in and start listening. Yeah rather than giving a stage to the very opposite people that you don't even want to promote and they'll just talk over you and interrupt you and um, say the very opposite things and use uh, logical fallacies to try and sway people's opinions. You're just getting yourself in the muck there versus being completely confident in your own space and developing your knowledge of it with other people who are also doing that same thing and then you're creating like these conscious communities of of uh, people who are uh, talking the same way rather than purposely going into a, a middle ground or into the enemy territory and trying to battle it out that way. Even in family dynamics or something like this, it works that way because like we're saying, oftentimes these simple discussions about just some fringe topic that shouldn't be anything at all can be relationship destroying conversations. As a result, I think that as I've evolved myself, uh, as people know, I've when I first came out about these things, I was quite vocal and not too good at maybe conveying them so that, yeah, I destroyed a few relationships along the way. In so doing, I learned how to do better, how to not do that, and so now, when the topic comes up, as you said, oftentimes my initial response, well, always the initial response is this one. Yeah. You don't need to say anything right away the second you feel it. That, that's what um, that's what we're talking about with a lot of these other issues is the 2023, I'm so triggered, I'm so offended. <laughs> so Microaggression. As, right, as flat earthers, we gotta keep that in check ourselves as well. And just because our, our circles our friends and family are saying the word global or something and we're just like <laughs> literally that happened last global night. what yeah. I, know. I was at like this beautiful concert right like um it's like a candlelight concert here in miami and and it was uh they were i don't know whatever it was beautiful and literally the woman was introducing the concert and she was like talking about how now they're global. And I literally felt this like kink inside myself and I had to self soothe where I'm like, it's, it's just a word. Like it, and, and words are spells, but it's, it's just a word. It, it's not personal. Like it's not a personal attack. It doesn't necessarily have to like cloud and contaminate the whole experience just because, right. And this is where like the, I call it the community wound, but it's like, why I'm obviously so excited to connect to you and like brought in, you know, my community is so that I can taste that, like that sense of belonging, right? So that is a wound I believe we're all walking around with, right? So, so it's that tribal discernment, right? If I'm looking around for what is the, the, the tag, right? Like if I were on a dating app and I were to like choose the criteria for like what my man would believe, like these are the discerning 
intellectual features so that I can relax and not have to like think <laughs> and like get, you know, back to dancing or whatever. <laughs> um, and so I understand the roots of that sort of like black and white assessment of somebody's, you know, awakenedness or whatever. And it can be really just like something that flows through you, like data, you know, information, like a felt sense. And, and I have people in my life who not so much who like vehemently disagree with my perspectives, but who really don't give a shit about the things I really do give a shit about. Mm -hmm. And we connect deeply, you know, in many, I mean, I know you do too. So, so allowing for that, there was a, many years in my life where I did not allow for that, you know, and I ended relationships like over this. And again, that's maturational. Like that's a stage we, we go through until we get to the place where everyone can just be who the hell they are. We recognize we always have power of choice and are responsible for our own experience. And then navigating becomes a totally different thing. Mm. And focusing more on having a deep relationship and opening uh, a level of communication with whoever the person is that you would like to relay the flat earth message to. I find that setting the groundwork is invaluable rather than just, oh, a new person. This person doesn't know the earth's flat. Hey, have you heard this thing? And then and they're like, mm -mm. rather than doing that, I, I think I'm trying to take the Taoist perspective, which is to try and wait as long as possible before intervening. Mm -hmm. So so if you're triggered because they said global and now you want to bring up the flat earth, <laughs> temper it in yourself and just be like, no, I'm just going to let that, I'm just going to let it slide. Just let yeah. it go. And, and instead, focus on finding common ground with, with the people. Even in a debate, this is what you want to do, is don't focus on the thing that you the two of you clearly clearly have opposing views about find something anything doesn't even have to be related to cosmology that you do agree with and deepen that aspect and let the conversation flow from there and especially if it's someone that you have multiple conversations with it's not just a chance encounter it's an actual relationship well even more reason to just let it let it ride for a while totally just be be a silent flat earther for now and <laughs> <laughs> until you find uh, the time. And when you do bring it up, rather than playing all your cards at once, I like to bring it up in question format mm. and just ask them leading questions towards things that I would like to talk about and then gauge how I'm going to talk about it on their responses. If they're inquisitive and there's no emotional reaction and they're just like, whoa, and okay, this conversation can continue and we might have a, a winner here. But if right from the first question, they get a little cockeyed and they're, and, and they're like, are you talking about flat earth? And then they get a, a, a sneer and all that. Okay, well, you've just gotten your answer. Yeah. And th you know this isn't going to go too well if, if you lean into it hard. But you started with a question. So you don't need to lean into it any further than that. And if they look at you cockeyed and you can just be like, well, I was just thinking about it, or somebody made a Facebook post about it, or I don't know, I, I was just considering it, but yeah, maybe not, or something, and just let it go. Rather than instantly butt head, you just got your confirmation. You got your confirmation that they're not ready yet. And rather than accept that, which is what we should do, we like to push. And it was the same with like uh, vegans. It's the thing people yeah. hate the most about vegans oh. is that we get holier than thou about the <laughs> position that we hold. And then we want to try and force it onto somebody else. Uh, and especially in that situation, because we feel, oh, the animals, but that you're, you're harming the animal. And so we feel like we're being a protector and a provider rather than uh, what we're actually doing in the moment, which is being a accuser. And we're, you know, putting somebody down in a way. And nobody wants that. Nobody wants to feel that. So every vegan proselytizer is wrong, you know, going about it wrong. It, it's never going to have the effect you want. Right. And it's maybe interacting with the projected and rejected part of themselves, the meat eater that they were, let's say, right, or could be. And that play, again, like I think of these as erotic 
you know, I call it the erotic caress of the enemy it becomes almost this obsessive intimacy that you have with your own self through another person, right? Because I think it's possible that we're only ever triggered about our beliefs if we don't fully believe them, right? Like if, if we have not fully settled and integrated, which requires that we have a relationship, like I was saying, to the part of us that didn't know, to the part of us that got it wrong, um, and to, you know, to the meat eater and the vegan, to the glober and the flat earther, to, you know, the 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 pharma prescriber, you know, in the holistic, you know, liver or whatever you want to say. And and if we don't complete that cycle, like we don't finish that, not that it's ever finished, but that work, then we're still in dynamic intimacy. We're projecting. We're yeah, projecting exactly. it onto the other non-vegans and non-flat earthers and feeling like we're not flat earth enough if they don't convert. <laughs> right. no, but if you know it and, and you, you know, that's why I was saying, no, just go right back to your books. Just yeah. reconfirm for yourself your belief, your knowledge, get it, uh, expand it to the point that when somebody throws up those ego defense mechanisms and, and makes those claims you've heard a hundred times about if the earth was flat, then a cat would have knocked everything off the edge by now or something. And and you can genuinely laugh and smile at, at you know, what's going on here rather than be triggered and feel like, you know, you're, oh, I'm in for, I'm in for hours of lengthy, terrible conversation or whatever. Well, you, you will, if that's what you do, yes. you know, you Imagine. don't have to. You don't have to create a multi-hour, you know, argumentative debate because of that little action. You can just, okay, well, cool. And and this is the thing I was saying about, uh, you said, like, deeply, get into your deep relationship rather than some deep conversation about this, this thing that you don't agree with. If you relate to the other person on other things and you stand in your, your knowledge and your masculine, so to speak, why would you even need to convert or convince someone else? You you being the, the flat earther that you are and 100% you knowing it, you know, and the more knowledge, the more expansive it is, the more you just have like an aura, basically. This is what I'm, I'm trying to advocate is, is advance your flat earther aura or your <laughs> vegan, your vegan or whatever the thing is that you would really like to be an activist for and you would like everyone else to be this thing. I really want you to change it. The best way to do it is to become, is to shut up about it, first of all, because you lose your power the second you start trying to project it onto everyone else and just be silent in that leadership role of knowing you're right about these things and just waiting for them to come to you. You don't even, you don't really have to go to them. If if you feel like you have to go to them and, and proselytize and do activism, and they're not coming to you because you're the old wise vegan who has all the health answers, or you're the old wise flat earther who seems to know a lot more than Neil deGrasse Tyson when he talks about the globe, it just doesn't make any sense anymore. And then this crazy flat earth guy that everyone's been making fun of for a decade, I tuned into one of his podcasts and he just sounds like a normal guy and he makes sense. And then suddenly your paradigm shifts and I don't have to debate Neil deGrasse Tyson. And I don't have to go into the arena and um, prove myself in that way just like you don't have to in your conversation with your dad or with your brother or your sister or whatever. It doesn't have to be this relationship dividing issue unless really you make it that way. Yeah. That's the thing that, again, we're not really taking the responsibility. When I talk about uh, losing these friendships, uh, I would like it to be because they can't handle the truth. <laughs> But in reality, is that what happened? They really just couldn't yeah. handle the truth? Or did I not convey the truth in a way that kept our relationship together? Yeah, prioritized. In other words, yeah, yeah, I prioritized my projection of these truths over the sanctity of the relationship and was letting it end. And so that speaks to a problem on my account. Why did I make the truth or you know some some truism, some aspect that I think is right, and I want them to know that it's right as well, end the whole relationship? Yeah. Well, that's my shortcoming, not theirs, really. Mm -hmm. So when flat earthers are um, despondent or, or what, you know, in this situation and worrying, and, and again, like we talked about with the narcissist discussion, trying to label and point fingers at the other person like you're the bad boy, 
well, look at your how you're contributing to this dichotomy. And if you stop contributing to the dichotomy, the dichotomy will cease to exist. Right. And they'll, by preaching to the choir and singing such beautiful music long enough, they're just going to come over to your side anyway without you having to engage and, and try to convert. The conversion will happen just by your authority, just by you stepping into your truth and being there long enough that, and shining, like, like I said, an aura of truth that people will just kind of start to gravitate towards you and away from the liars that that emanate an aura of darkness. Totally. I mean, I, I can't remember who, I like to be attributional accurately, but I can't remember where I heard this, but anyway, it's like, it's like, you know, when you're early in martial arts, right? Like, let's say you're a guy who's learning martial arts and you're at a bar and like, you're just picking up all these skills and like somebody like messes with you a little, like you're going to like start a whole brawl, right? But when you're more trained and you're more in your mastery, your presence alone, <laughs> I guess my cat mushy. Oh. Um, your presence alone, you know, is the limiting step for any sort of conflict. And then even if somebody were to attempt to step to you, like all you'd have to do is like literally like, t you know, offer a glance or like turn, move your body in a certain direction. And that's it. That's so a that's great, the kind great of analogy. Mastery. Yeah. You're the, talking uh, in, in martial arts, de-escalation is what you would do in those situations. Right. And in these conversations, that's what you should do as well, is what I'm saying is if you see that, you know, this isn't going to go well because you just asked one question and then you got the side eye and everything, what I'm saying is to shut up. Just like yes. in the self-defense situation, if if you see that there's something going on, you don't one-up it and be like, oh yeah, well, you know, and get in the guy's face, like like you'd say somebody who maybe has just started martial arts and wants right. to prove to themselves prove. and everyone around them how good they are versus someone who's experienced and they know the nuances involved and that, you know, it hurts, it, at very least, it hurts your knuckles to punch somebody in the face and you don't want to deal with that. And then there's retribution. If you do win the fight, well, there could be a second fight and it'll come as a surprise attack that you can't win this time. And so there's all these other factors that you can learn about over time. And then you realize the only way to really win a fight is to not get in the fight in the first place. And if that's the case, then de-escalation becomes the main tactic of self-defense. And in flat earth conversations, I'm saying it's the same thing. If you yeah. notice the other person, first of all, don't you be the one that escalates. That's obviously the wrong, <laughs> you don't know the earth is flat, you stupid glober. <laughs> you know, obviously that's not the um, the way to go is to push your, yourself and be a, a negative force like that. But if they're doing it to you, then it's like we get the, oh, they started it. And then we can, we can uh, attack them as well. But in a self-defense situation, uh, that's not what you would want to yeah. do if you're looking to de-escalate. It's de-escalation at all costs. Even your ego, even the people around you thinking that you're you're a little bitch or whatever. Well, if it means you didn't get in a fight and you get to get out of there and go home to your family, then you won that fight. And it's the same thing with the flat earth, I think, is de-escalate these people that want to try to attack you for being a flat earther and just stand in your well, it's what I, uh, you know, I know the earth to be flat, but it's cool if you if you think it's uh, spinning, you know, pear shaped water ball, you know, <laughs> have at it, man. And and I'll usually have that kind of demeanor um, if somebody comes at me. Uh, it's funny to me. I've always been that way um, in school. Like I would be self depreciative with humor when bullies would try to, you know, they they. Uh, Duguay or something, you know, Eric Duguay or whatever. I get called that ever since you come back on YouTube. It's like high school comes back. It's like nobody <laughs> called me Eric Duguay until I, I got back on YouTube. And then suddenly it's like, oh, oh, I remember, oh <laughs> I remember what it's like to be, <laughs> to be back in high school. Yeah, it's all these names that um, the kids came up with. It's like you hear them all over again. But rather than being triggered to those kind of things, like like it is funny. To, like, I, I don't know. what Why feel something every time somebody calls you Eric Duguay. It's okay, it's funny, yeah, uh, okay. And and be fine with it authentically, just like I am with the flat earth now. It's it's my favorite subject to talk about, but if somebody is like, you stupid flat earth, I can't believe you can think this, blah, 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 and then they wanna walk away, or or they wanna, you know, even more so, It's I'm not gonna get upset about it like I would have before. It, 
there's something that happens when you just solidify your own knowledge, like I'm saying, rather than trying to project onto everyone else and convert everyone else. Once you get to this space in yourself where you're so sure of whatever, that you don't, A, you don't have to convert anyone, you don't have that feeling, and B, you convert them without even trying to. It's, in a non, yeah, non-linear way. Yeah, yeah right? exactly. Totally agree. I totally agree. It's like the the mystery. God works in mysterious ways. It's the same thing with the knowledge con conveying knowledge. It's like if you tr you can't you can lead a horse to water but can't make them drink thing. It's like they can hear all the same words if they're not ready. It's not going to even sink in. I, I, this happens to me all the time. Is I'll talk to somebody about one of these subjects, they'll reject it outright, and then years later they'll come to me and say the exact same thing mm -hmm. to me that I said to them as if I've never heard it, as if I wasn't the one that told that thing to them. And they're presenting it to me like, did you know this? And it's like, huh, so you've forgotten the conversation that we had where I told you this exact thing and you disagreed with me about it, you rejected it, and I kind of discounted you because of that. But then years pass and we haven't even talked again. Something happened in their life, either they talked to somebody else, or they read a book, or they had a think for themselves, and then suddenly that thing makes sense to them now, and then they bring it back to you because maybe, oh, I remember he's interested in this stuff, but they've forgotten that that's where it came from in the first place. And by this happening over and over again to me, I started recognizing that this is like a thing in human psychology. Yeah. So, A, everyone needs time to come to conclusions on their own. So. Every conversation you have where you're trying to convert, you're already pushing too hard because no matter what, it's not going to happen in that conversation. And so every time you see that they don't quite agree with you and you try to give another factoid, another bit of trivia and, and try to shut them down at every instance and you think that if, if you have an answer for every question they have and you shut them down that they have to convert, right? Because then they have nowhere to go. Nope, they still don't. They'll just bullheadedly just still say it's a globe for no reason. But but the real reason is is more it's now it's more ego based it's more reputation based it's not about the facts at hand now it's about the manner in which it's being presented it's about the fact that oh now you have to be right and I have to be wrong well you were wrong about that you thought it was a globe up until just now too so stop playing holier than thou and debating me about it like I'm the dumb glober because I just haven't figured it out yet and so that's again it's, this is bringing it back to the male-female dynamic that we were talking about earlier, it can be the same thing with the Glober flat earther dynamic where you are going too far in, on one <laughs> extreme and then you're alienating the other person. It's like I was saying about the op polarities attract but not opposites. Um, the globe and the flat earth, would, we could say that would be like the opposite that's you're pushing the conversation or pushing the relationship away. But the polarity that you could have that is the same is you probably both care quite a bit about that subject. If it's enough to end the relationship, obviously they they really do care. And they're not just like one of these people, like, well, I don't know, earth flat, I don't know. Because a lot of people are like that too. They totally, have no way. Totally. It's, and they're, they're the easiest to convert because they have no attachment to anything. And then you just talk to them for 10 minutes and well, that actually makes sense. <laughs> you know what? Then, then you make a quick flat earther out of these people. But it's very different from like some of the, like the atheist, Mm -hmm. um, you know, people that have watched NASA documentaries and, and believed every bit of the CGI from from birth. And then you come up to that and they want to be an astronaut or whatever. And, and you tell them the Earth's flat and NASA's lying to them like it's not going to go over too well. You're better off just letting them because they're going to be the last people to come to it anyway. That's another thing is like not there's going to be the first followers and the second fall. And then the last people to convert are going to be these people that you would debate with. But I don't think that's how it happens. These people, right. they don't convert through debates. They convert through consensus reality. Mm -hmm. So all we have to do is get to the tipping point of actual critical thinkers and people who actually think for themselves and stand in their own individuated spaces. And then once that tipping point has happened, all the other people who are just natural innate followers and non-critical thinkers and consensus reality conformist types they'll just become flat earthers because it's what everyone else is. Right. It's yeah, the, yeah. there's been the cultural shift and, and they won't need um, 
converting really they'll silently convert once they notice that most of their friends and families are saying these things they'll just be like they'll just go along to get along which is what they were doing with the globe <laughs> right and probably when the illusion of a consensus is right there's just more points of opinion available that's kind of all that's necessary for the shift but i think in this early window i mean right because i think about myself like i was like a scientism zealot um atheist and like very, very dismissive. One of those people when it comes to medicine, like that we're talking about, right? Like dismissive and yeah, derogatory. And my conversion event, again, that led me to become like in internationally known for the opposite opinion, uh, right? Because that's what you're saying is like the people who fight it the most often then are the greatest advocates, right? Um, it's it's an experience of cognitive dissonance. It's an experience of, it's a personal experience of, a, a fraying of the fabric of, of your reality. And we can't prescribe that to other people, right? Like that just happens when it happens. And mm. the readiness to um, proceed down the path less traveled at that moment of rupture, it's really not anyone's business, right? It's not my business whether somebody else does that. And I certainly wouldn't want somebody else to make it their business, right? So how I responded when I was like, as a total like pharma fiend, you know, diagnosed with my first illness, um, quote unquote, this was postpartum, um, my, my first pregnancy with, I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis that the, the, the dissonance was embedded in that moment for me where I didn't want to do the thing, take, take the prescription to CVS every month, you know, that I had said, I believed was, the truth, the right thing, the path, right? I didn't want to do it. It's fine for me to write these prescriptions for all these w women, but I didn't want to do that. And so I could have like, you know, doubled down and found some place for me in that old belief system, or, you know, I could have gone rogue and, and just um, move through the initiation portal, right? Of having been wrong, more than wrong. I mean, I've done years of work on the shame that I feel around my role, because I specialize in treating pregnant and breastfeeding women, like my role, right? In that in that chain of custody of trust, like I was a very specific <laughs> link, right? These women trusted me. And that's in part why they chose to medicate themselves during their pregnancies. Like that's, obviously it's all co-creation, but it was a lot for me to metabolize and alchemize there. Mm. And, you know, that rupture took me in this direction where I was, interested, I guess, on some semi-conscious level in doing the work required to um, hold, you know, all of those emotions. So it's like, it's like when we remember, it's like really none of our business, like what somebody else's process looks like. It's just so liberating. Like, and it, it also smokes out that rescuer, right? Like it's very common that in our angle of the triangle, like as, you know, activists and information purveyors, right? Like we imagine we need to save mankind, save the world, like save people from themselves. Like, and it's, it's just another, um, flavor of victim consciousness, reifying the victimhood that we are interacting with and the person who we are helping to see the truth. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so for me that the superiority thing is how I can most easily smoke it out is when I imagine that I know better and, and that I'm even better, right? Like, am I really better than I was 20 years ago? Like, I don't know for sure. Like I look at people in my life and, and family and whatever who have not taken the path I've taken. And like, there's a, a way I could be like, oh, they haven't done any of the work. Like, eh. and there's like a perspective I can have that's like, I'm not really sure my life is, you know, like I have an amazing life. And is it better? Like, is it is it, is it a qualitative meritocracy? Like, is it really? Or is it just like, you can just play different parts and characters and play with yourself in different ways. Like, I don't know, the, the humility piece um, has been really important for me to get in touch with uh, because otherwise I find myself in a covert dimension of the victim triangle pretending that I am, you know, otherwise, I guess. Um, but I have been really, you know, surprised and delighted by how much on the same page we are in, in this realm because what I find is that people get very myopically focused on what they're truthing, right? So whether that's like chemtrails or, you know, injectables or like you know, whatever, whatever, there's infinite um, activist pet topics. And then these other um, 
I don't know, realms are really neglected. So I love having all of these like woven in because I think until we can really understand the nature of the inside job (laughs) of of truthing and also clean up our relationships, I'm not sure we're ever going to feel the fulfillment that is available through the awakening process, right? Like it just becomes this fetishized like being right ladder, right? Um, so I really, really enjoyed this. And yeah, and I like to, you know, I obviously also still like to talk about um, deception in the realm of of medicine and allopathy. And, you know, it's almost like my past life in a way, you know, um, where I focus so much of my energy. And I did make a shift. I had a mentor, Nicholas Gonzalez, and he was uh, like a spiritual figure in my life. That's a euphemistic way of putting it. And you know, he helped me to, in his death, actually make the shift from like fighting the bad <laughs> daddy government and bad mommy medicine into this place of like celebrating what's possible, you know, like the adventure of illness, like, and the existential question that only you can answer um, when your symptoms arise. And so that shift, like out of the fixing the bad thing into like, we, we've been discussing like, you know, creating um, the conditions for you to experience what is joy inducing and inspiring. And um, that can happen in any one of these topics. And maybe it's required that we really sit in the shit and get our hands dirty and roll around in the like the heinous nature of the deception that's been run on us through our own consent, which is the worst part. Um, And then we can, you know, dust ourselves off and get up and and figure out like what we want to do with it. So um, yeah, I've, I've so enjoyed this, this conversation.